Marfa, Texas, a small desert city in West Texas, is the kind of place where the horizon stretches out like a lazy cat in the sun. If you're from around here like Officer Diego Torres is, you grew up knowing every crease and shadow of the land like the lines of your palm. Diego's roots ran deep in the dusty soil of this town since his family lived there for generations. His family is as much as a fixture there as the Welcome to Marfa sign. Diego's days were usually as predictable as the sunrise, dealing with the occasional speeding ticket or the stray dog causing a ruckus. That is until the night the lights decided to dance a little too close to home. Now, the Marfa lights, to those who don't know, are like the town's claim to fame. They are flickering orbs of light that flicker on the desert's edge. But they're always elusive and always at a distance, like a mirage. Outside of town, there is even a viewing platform from which they can sometimes be seen. Locals had their theories and tourists ate up the stories with the kind of hunger you often see for unsolved mysteries. Diego never bought into them, though. To him, they were just atmospheric tricks, something science could explain away if only someone wanted to look into it. That was until the dispatch call came through on a night that was as dry as can be and tasted like dust. Torres, you there? We got a situation out by the Mitchell Ranch. Lights are playing up again, but apparently, they are closer than ever. Old Man Mitchell is real spooked. The crackle of the radio was usually the lead-up to something routine, but this time, it was different. Diego felt a prickle run down his spine as he responded. On my way, he said. He knew that Old Man Mitchell wasn't one to call if it wasn't important. His patrol car kicked up a storm as it barreled down the dirt road the dashboard lights painting two lines on the road. Eventually, he made his way out to the ranch, and as soon as the car rumbled to a stop at the edge of the Mitchell property, he saw them too, the lights, as bright as can be and completely undeniable. Diego stepped out, his hand instinctively resting on the protection clipped on his hip. He wasn't sure what use it would be against lights in the sky, but it was a comfort all the same. A comfort he never had to use before, but a comfort nonetheless. The lights hovered, a grouping of silent flickers, and then they moved purposefully, almost as if they were alive. His eyes narrowed, trying to make sense of what he was seeing. It was then that he saw it, a shape within the glow. It was unlike anything Diego had ever seen, the shape of a creature that was as clear as day. Its form shifted like smoke caught in a breeze. Yet there was something strangely soothing about its movements that held Diego's gaze. Diego's breath caught in his throat. His years of training had not prepared him for an encounter with the inexplicable. The creature made of lights then seemed to notice him, its movements pausing as though acknowledging his presence. It was then that the lights began to change again, colors changing and pulsating in a rhythm that felt almost like communication. A lesser man might have fled, but Diego Torres was not one to turn his back on the unknown, especially not here in his hometown that he had sworn to protect. He stood his ground, watching as the lights danced in the sky. The night air then started to hum with a charge that tickled the hairs on his arms, and Diego could almost hear a voice, not loud but more like a whisper. The message was cryptic sounds that didn't translate into human language, but somehow he felt he could understand it. It spoke of something beyond the reaches of human understanding, and as quickly as it had begun, and as soon as he started to listen, the creature and its lights retreated into the shadows, basically disappearing as if it had never been there at all. Diego looked back towards the front door of Mitchell's ranch house and could see the silhouette of old man Mitchell standing there in his doorway, armed and looking out towards the direction in the sky where the figure had showed itself. Then he gave a nod to Diego and went back inside and shut the door. Diego was left standing alone, the silence a heavy blanket around his shoulders. He knew he couldn't report this. Who would believe him other than old man Mitchell? It wasn't lost on him that he, the skeptic, had now become the witness to the extraordinary truth. The next days were a blur of routine and restless nights. Diego kept his encounter to himself, but often thought of heading out there again. 
but he knew that the issue was closed as far as Mr. Mitchell was concerned. Diego could tell that by the way the old man nodded his head that night. And the truth was likely as elusive as the creature itself, and Diego knew he was unlikely to find it. In time, the encounter became a part of him, a story he would never tell, but that changed the way he looked at the night sky. The skeptic had become a believer, not in easy answers, but in the struggle that he endured after the encounter. And as for the lights, they continued their distant dance, a reminder of the night when the universe had whispered its secrets to an officer of the law and an old man on his porch. Diego never saw the creature again, but sometimes, when the desert was still, he could feel the echo of its message in his bones. To this day, he and the old man give each other a knowing nod when they run into each other at town. But other than that, Diego feels alone with his knowledge, wondering if there is anything else he should do to serve and protect his town from what he knows exists nearby. You know, everyone in Asheville has their own version of a story about strange creatures that live in the mountains. Some are legends passed down through generations, and some are encounters that people experienced firsthand. But this story, it's mine. And I swear on every pine tree, in every misty morning in the Great Smoky Mountains, it's true. It was mid-autumn when it happened. The kind of day when the air is so crisp, you can almost snap it in half. I've always found peace in the miles and miles of trails that wind through the Smokies. There's a rhythm to my footsteps there that I can't replicate anywhere else. It's like I'm one with nature, and that puts life into perspective for me. That day, I set out to clear my head, the way I had a hundred times before. But as the sun began to set, something was different. I was completely lost. Now, I know those trails. I could walk them with my eyes closed and one hand tied behind my back. But that day, every path looked the same. Every tree was a stranger, and the comforting rustle of wildlife had gone silent. The silence was suffocating. That's when I saw it, or him or her. I couldn't really tell. I couldn't quite believe my eyes. There it was, massive and somehow familiar, like something out of a dream or an old story my grandpa used to tell. It had this thick fur that looked like it could shrug off the worst winter chill, but it wasn't all wild and savage. The fur had this cozy look to it, like if you were to touch it, it might feel like your favorite blanket, all warm and comforting. It walked kind of funny, like it wasn't quite sure if it was supposed to walk on all fours or stand up tall like us. Its arms or front legs, I'm not really sure what to call them. They swung by its sides, heavy with muscle under that fur. But its fingers, man, they were something else. They were fine and nimble, like they were made for picking things up gently, not for hunting or fighting. And those legs, they were sturdy all right, like the trunks of the old oaks around my childhood home, like they could carry it up the side of a mountain without breaking a sweat. It moved with a kind of clumsy grace, if that makes any sense, like a dancer who's too strong for the stage. But the face, that's what got me. It wasn't a bear's face, no sir. It was flatter, broader, and there was an intelligence in it that you just don't see in wild animals. Its jaw was something fierce, sure, but the fur there was softer, and it almost seemed to invite you to come a bit closer. Take a better look. Those ears, though, they were always on the move, twitching and turning at every little sound. It had this mane, too, all wild and majestic, the kind of thing you'd expect to see on a king in some fantasy book. It made it look noble, like it was the ruler of these woods, and we were just guests passing through. It wasn't menacing, no. It was almost like it expected me, like it had emerged from the very earth to stand before me. I couldn't move, couldn't breathe. There was just the creature, the forest, and me. It turned and began to walk, not on all fours, but upright. Its steps were deliberate, purposeful, and something inside me whispered to follow. So, I did. We walked in silence, the only sound the crunch of leaves beneath our feet and the occasional snap of a branch. It led me through twists and turns, up steep inclines, and down into valleys I didn't remember being there before. The weirdest part? I wasn't scared. You'd think I'd be out of my mind with fear, 
but I wasn't. It was like the forest had accepted me as part of it, with the creature as my guide. Just when my legs began to burn with the effort, the creature stopped. It turned to look at me, its gaze piercing through the growing darkness. And then, as if it was satisfied with what it saw, it nodded. I swear, it nodded. And then it stepped back. That's when I saw it. The trail. My trail. The one I'd walked so many times before. I was back. How did I miss it? How did I not see the way? I looked back to thank the creature, but it was gone. Vanished like it was never there. Like it was just a shadow or a figment of my imagination. But it wasn't. I know it wasn't. I don't know what it was about that creature, why it helped me. I've been back to the Smokies since, trying to find it, trying to get a second glimpse and prove to myself I'm not crazy. But it's like it was only there for me in that moment of need, and now it's just a part of the forest again. So there's my story. Not a ghost, not a ghoul, but a creature covered in fur. And a creature that I feel is a guardian of the lost. Some might chuckle and say it's the altitude or the isolation. But if you ever find yourself wandering the Smokies, keep an eye out. You might just need a guide and I can't promise you it'll be human. It was back in Flagstaff, Arizona, where Derek made his life as a successful musician. He wasn't born with a silver spoon or a golden ticket to stardom. No, not at all. In fact, music was just a passion for him. From an early age, it was his ticket to somewhere else. Somewhere where music could be the main focus of his life. Because what he dreamed about, what he wanted, was a life on the stage. And he's the real deal, a true blue musician based in Flagstaff. But now, let's talk about the Grand Canyon. You know it, I'm sure. It's this massive ancient gorge that could swallow cities whole. It's Derek's favorite place to go and get inspiration. Says it's like nature's own amphitheater. He goes there when the world gets confusing, when he needs to hear his own thoughts, or more accurately, his own music. One crisp morning, Derek's out there, guitar in hand, just riffing away. That's when it happens. This sound slices through the air. It's sharp, melodic, and so darn pure that his guitar string just stops vibrating. This isn't any echo he's ever heard before. It's like the canyon itself is singing back to him. Curiosity gets the best of him, obviously. He's a musician, right? And sound is his whole thing. So, he follows the sounds he's hearing. The tune leads him deeper into the canyon, beyond the trails and the tour groups, and the hikers. He even ventures past the do not enter signs. The further he goes, the clearer it gets. And it's almost... Familiar? Hours pass. The sun's beating down, and Derek's starting to think maybe he's chasing a ghost, some acoustic trick of the landscape. But then, he sees it. Not a ghost, but something definitely not from any biology book he's ever seen. It's there, basking on a sunlit rock, scales shimmering all shades of colors. It's got limbs, sure, but they're all wrong, bending in ways that make Derek's own fingers twitch. Its eyes are closed, but its throat, that's where the magic's happening. The creature's crouching there making music, but not exactly music. It's the purest sound Derek's ever heard. It's like the creature's speaking in some kind of melody morse code, and he wonders if he's the only one who can hear it, at least the only human. Derek, bless his soul, he's a goner. Not in a bad way, mind you. He's just lost in this sound. It's weaving through his senses, making the hairs on his arm stand up like each one's at its own little concert. He realizes this thing, this beautiful, impossible critter, it's talking to him. Not with words, but with something older, something primal. And that's when Derek decides to start playing his guitar. Yeah, sounds weird, but that's the only thing his musician mind could think to do. And while he plays, Derek is very aware that he's getting lost in the exchange. He's not just playing music anymore, he's becoming it. His fingers move differently, his ears hear differently, and he plays for hours before finally heading back. Derek tries to recreate the sounds back in the studio. No matter how hard he tries, he just can't get it right. It's like the sounds can only be made in the canyon. 
So, he packs up his gear one more time, feeling this mix of hope and hesitation, and heads back to the canyon. He's not exactly sure what he's looking for, but something deep inside tells him he has to go. When he gets there, the canyon is just as majestic and silent as ever. Derek finds his old spot, the very place where he felt that strange, unexplainable connection. With his guitar in hand, he plays, letting his music fill the air, hoping against hope for some kind of sign, an answer, or maybe even a miraculous appearance from the creature. But the canyon remains silent this time. There's no response, no magical encounter, just the echo of his own music against the vast, empty walls. It's a sobering moment for Derek. He sits there for a while, letting the reality sink in that whatever had happened before was truly a once-in-a-lifetime experience. The realization hits him hard, but there's also this sense of peace that comes with it. He knows that it was meant to be and was meant to leave a lasting impact. As the sun begins to set, painting the sky with vibrant streaks of sunlight, Derek plays one last song, and then, with the final note echoing into the silence, he packs up his guitar for the last time and takes one long last look at the canyon. It's like saying goodbye to an old friend, knowing you'll carry the memories with you forever. Back in Flagstaff, life goes on. Derek's music, though, it's changed. There's a new depth to it, a touch of melancholy that wasn't there before. He never does find what he went back for, but in a way, he doesn't need to. And so, he is forever changed by a strange occurrence that he's now second-guessing ever happened. Zoe had always felt a really strong connection to Shenandoah National Park, a huge expanse of wilderness that seemed to stretch into eternity. But she worked as a ranger, a role she'd aspired to since her childhood when her grandparents first introduced her to the wonders of the natural world. Her days were often spent leading hikes or educational programs, but her passion lay in the quiet moments, camera in hand, waiting for the perfect shot that captured the essence of the park's wildlife. Her hobby had given her a deep appreciation for the subtleties of the forest, the way a deer might tilt its head to listen more intently, or how the early morning mist clung to the spider webs in the meadows. These details were her treasures, but one autumn morning, as the park's colors were changing, Zoe's routine photography session took an unexpected turn. The morning had started ordinarily enough, she set off before dawn with her camera, eager to catch the golden hour light that photographers dream about. The chill in the air was a stark contrast to the warm bed she had left behind, but the potential for the perfect photograph fueled her enthusiasm. The forest was waking up, and the sounds of nature filled the air. The chirping of birds, the rustling of leaves, and the distant call of an elk. Zoe had found a serene spot near a clearing where she knew deer often grazed. The light was just right, and she could see the dew still clinging to the grass and trees. She settled in, her camera ready, and it wasn't long before a young doe stepped into the frame. Zoe held her breath and clicked the shutter, capturing a series of photos as the deer lifted its head, ears perked, sensing Zoe's presence. It was only when she reviewed the photos on her camera's screen that she noticed it. In the background, partially obscured by the brush, was a figure. It was tall and indistinct, a blur of fur and what seemed like limbs. Zoe's first thought was that it might be a bear standing on its hind legs, but the shape was all wrong. Bears didn't have that kind of height, and they certainly didn't stand so intentionally. Confusion settled in as Zoe zoomed in on the image. The figure seemed to be looking right at her, its gaze palpable, even through the grainy photo. It wasn't possible, she reasoned. The park was known for its wildlife, yes, but nothing like this. Her mind raced through every logical explanation. A trick of the light, a distortion of branches, a fellow ranger playing a prank, but none fit the figure in the photo. She looked up from her camera, scanning the clearing with a new sense of awareness. The forest had fallen silent, and Zoe felt the weight of being watched. She called out, her voice sounding small against the vastness of the forest. Hello? There was no response, just the echo of her own voice. 
The suspense of the moment stretched on as she slowly packed her camera away, her eyes never leaving the spot where she'd seen the figure. With every rustle of the leaves, her heart skipped a beat, half expecting the creature to step out from its hiding place. Zoe returned to the ranger station with more questions than answers. She pored over books of local fauna, spoke in hushed tones with her colleagues, and even reached out to field experts. But the creature in the photo remained a mystery. Some couldn't even see the figure she saw. It was unlike any species documented in the park, or anywhere else for that matter. The days that followed were a mix of routine and restless curiosity. Zoe continued her work, but the photograph haunted her. She found herself drawn back to the clearing time and again, hoping for another glimpse of the creature. She took more photos, hoping to catch it again, but it was as if the figure had been a ghost, present for a single moment and then gone, if it was even ever there. As the seasons changed and the first snow began to fall, the figure in the photograph remained a complete mystery. Zoe's search for clarity had brought her nothing but dead ends. The park's wildlife resumed its natural rhythm, and her thoughts of the mysterious figure started to become few and far between. Zoe did keep the photograph, a reminder of that strange and confusing day. She never did find out what the creature was, and perhaps that was for the best. Maybe that the safest option too because who knows what it was and what it could be capable of if it didn't like what was happening around it. So I've got this good friend, Nora. She's from St. George, Utah, the real outdoorsy type. She's the kind who finds comfort in the red rocks, in the endless sky here in Zion that turns all kinds of crazy colors when the sun sets. Nora, She's been hiking and climbing Zion National Park since she was a little kid. Her parents are hikers and climbers too, and so it was just natural for her to be the same. Anyway, Nora was telling me about this one time she decided to stay up in Zion later than usual to catch the sunset. She does that sometimes, says it's like watching the world fall asleep. So, she hikes up to this spot she loves, a place where the view is just killer but nearly impossible to get to. But this time, it's different. The air's got this chill, not the usual desert evening cool, but something that makes you think of old stories and goosebumps. She's up there watching the sky as the sun is setting, when she notices a figure on the cliffs across from her. From where she's standing, it looks like someone dancing, all graceful and stuff, with these long limbs and what looked like antlers. Yeah, antlers like a deer or an elk, but this isn't an animal, and the antlers make her think of dead trees in the middle of winter, all spindly and going every which way. She said she saw that it was standing on two legs, moving in a way that makes you think of wind through the pines, smooth and kind of eerie, and also, it's this gaunt thing that's all stretched out, like it's been starved, skin tight over its bones, so pale it's almost ghostly. Nora is curious, but also a bit freaked out. She's never felt this way before in the park. She blinks, and when she looks again, that figure, that dancer, is gone. Just poof. In its place is this old juniper tree, twisted and gnarled like it's been there since forever, watching over the valley. So, she's standing there, trying to figure out if the dying light played tricks on her eyes, when this cold feeling sinks into her bones. It's like the temperature dropped 20 degrees in a heartbeat. She wraps her jacket tighter around her and starts thinking about those old Native American tales her grandpa used to tell her. The ones that you're not sure if they're meant to teach you something or just scare you straight. The word Wendigo flashes through her mind. It's this legend, right? A creature that's all about hunger and cold and the wrong kind of solitude. People who get lost in the woods, who get twisted by their own greed, or by the harshness of winter. Apparently, they turn into these things. Wendigos are always craving, never satisfied. It's just a story, but up there, with the stars peeking out and the night coming on fast, it feels a little too real. She shakes her head, trying to laugh it off. You're letting the dark get to you, she mutters to herself. But she can't shake the feeling that she saw something, something that wasn't supposed to be real. She's a logical person, doesn't believe in monsters under the bed, 
but what she saw, it's hard to explain. Nora heads back down the trail, quickening her pace but not wanting to run. Running feels like giving in to the fear, admitting that she saw something otherworldly, and she's not about to do that, not yet anyway. As she walks, every rustle in the bushes, every snap of a twig, has her heart doing double time. She tells herself it's just rabbits or maybe a deer, but part of her, a part she doesn't want to acknowledge, is listening for footsteps that aren't her own. By the time she gets back to her car, the stars are out in full force, and the park is quiet, the kind of quiet that's loud, you know. She drives home with the heater on full blast, trying to chase away the chill that settled in her bones. She doesn't talk about it much, says it makes her sound crazy, but sometimes she wonders if what she saw was even real, or something more confusing than she'll ever understand. Something ancient that doesn't often show itself. And me? I don't know what to think. I mean, Nora's as level-headed as they come. If she says she saw something, then maybe she did. But a Wendigo? Those are just stories, right? Personally, I'm super scared and don't know how to proceed with the information. Or if I, we should just keep our mouths shut. Anyway, I decided to share this with you in hopes of hearing what other people think. Thanks for lending an ear. It was a typical Thursday afternoon in 1995 when Carson City's strange occurrences found their way to Officer Jack Sullivan's desk. There was no emergency, no chase to be had, just a strange encounter with a sound that didn't fit the desert's usual sounds. The people who reported it said it was a cry, but not the kind you could easily forget or dismiss. It was a sound that seemed to indicate that something was very, very wrong. Jack's job, for all its worth, had become a routine, but this? This was something that had never happened before. This perked up his interest. So, it wasn't long before Jack found himself steering his cruiser towards the outskirts of town and towards the hills, trying to figure out the source of the noise. The air grew colder as he climbed in elevation, the desert's daytime scorch giving way to an evening chill of the hills. The hills of Carson City, Nevada were familiar and comforting, yet tonight they seemed a little more ominous, as if something was about to happen. He parked his cruiser at the foot of a trail he knew well and continued on foot. He hiked with the patience of a man who knew the land, who understood that some answers only came when you stopped looking for them. He was about 30 minutes into the hills when he saw it, the creature. It was hunched over a stream its form revealing itself in the soft glow of Jack's flashlight. It was shocking to say the least, with fur that seemed to ripple as the creature moved. Its limbs were long, bending in ways that defied Jack's understanding of anatomy, and its head was turned away, focusing on something in the water. Jack's breath caught in his throat. He felt safe for the moment, not knowing if the creature knew he was there yet. He should have been afraid, perhaps should have backed out of there, but instead, he found himself rooted to the spot. Then the creature turned, and Jack saw its face. It was oddly symmetrical, with eyes that were a deep black, and in them, a flicker of a look that almost seemed human. It wasn't hostile. There was a gentle curiosity there. He knew he should report this, should call it in, but something held him back. This creature, this being, it didn't need to be bothered in its own element. So, Jack did something he couldn't have imagined doing. He sat down, right there on the cold ground, and watched the creature watch him. Jack didn't move, not even a muscle, his breath barely a whisper in the chill air. The creature seemed to mirror his stillness, its gaze lingering on him with what Jack could only describe as a mild interest, not unlike a hiker spotting a deer in the wilderness. Time lost its meaning as the stars began to come out. The creature would continue its existence, unbothered by human interference, and Jack just sat there mesmerized. The night grew older, and the cold seeped through Jack's uniform, but he didn't care. He was entranced, watching the creature's every move. It would occasionally dip its head to the water, come up with something wriggling in its mouth, and eat. The rest of the time, it just sat there, almost as if it was contemplating the quiet world around it. 
Jack's mind wandered as he sat there. He thought about how this moment would never find its way into the official logs. How could it? What would he write? Sat and watched a strange creature from who knows where wouldn't exactly fly with the chief. And yet, this felt more real than any patrol he'd ever been on. More significant than the chases and the takedowns. As dawn approached, the creature stood up, its joints cracking with the movement. It was tall, taller than what he had even envisioned. It stretched, and for a moment, its silhouette was etched against the sky. Then, without a sound, it turned and walked away, its steps silent, its form blending into the surroundings until it was just a part of the hills, as natural as the rocks and the trees. Jack stayed a while longer, even after the creature had gone, trying to etch every detail into his memory. The way the fur moved, the intelligent gaze, the silent strength. Eventually he stood too, his body stiff from hours of inactivity, and began the walk back to where he'd left his cruiser. The sun was just peeking over the horizon when he got back to town. He drove through the empty streets, the world around him waking up, oblivious to the fact that just a few miles away, something extraordinary was living in the hills. Back at the station, Jack sat at his desk, staring at the blank incident report form in front of him. He picked up his pen several times, only to put it back down. Finally, he leaned back in his chair, rubbing his eyes, feeling the weight of the night in his bones. He didn't file a report that day or any day after. Some things, he decided, were meant to stay in the hills. This creature deserved a life of its own, in its own surroundings. It belonged there more than any human did, and Jack worried that humans would try to ruin that for the creature. So, Jack carried on with his job, the routines, the chases, the everyday hustle of being a cop. But every now and then, he'd drive out to the hills, park his cruiser, and look out towards the horizon, wondering about the creature, hoping it was still out there, living its life untouched, unbothered, and free. And now that it's been almost 35 years since the encounter, he's sharing his story in hopes of expanding understanding for these creatures and helping them to live the life they deserve. So I've been working at Yosemite National Park as a ranger for a few good years now. And with all that time spent outside, I had gotten to know the place really well. You even start to tell yourself you know everything there is to know about a place. I mean, the trails, the trees, even the way the wind sounds before a storm rolls in. But this one time, I'm telling you, it became very clear to me that there's no way I knew everything about that park. It was one of those crisp evenings where you could smell the pine in the air, and the sky was just starting to get that purple tinge to it. I was finishing up my usual rounds when I spotted something odd near the station. There were these little stacks of twigs and rocks, arranged in a way that was just unnatural. At first glance, I figured it was some kid's project or a hiker, marking their trail in a creative way. I didn't think much of it and went about my business, but man, it stuck with me. You know when you see something out of place and it just nags at you? For the next few nights, I couldn't shake this odd feeling. Like I needed to look more into it. Like I had been chosen to be the one. Yeah, that was it. I'd be out on patrol and I'd feel eyes on me. Not the usual, oh, there's probably a deer or a raccoon out there kind of feeling. It was more like a, there's something focused on me vibe. Gave me the creeps, to be honest. Then, this one night, it all came to a head. The moon was full and bright, casting these long, eerie shadows between the trees. And the forest was quiet. I was walking by the spot with those twig and rock arrangements when I heard this soft, rustling sound. Like a whisper, almost. I turned around and let me tell you, my heart must have skipped a beat or two. There was this... thing standing there. It was hard to see at first because it blended in so perfectly with the trees its skin or bark or whatever. It looked just like the tree trunks. The more I tried to focus, the more its edges seemed to blur with the surroundings. Like it was there, and then it wasn't. Just like any other forest animal that you try to focus on. And the way it stood there, so still it could have been mistaken for another pine or cedar.
But it wasn't just the camouflage that got me. It was the way it seemed to be both there and not there at the same time. Like when you look at those old magic eye pictures and suddenly the image pops out at you. Except this wasn't just some colorful pattern on paper. It was a living, breathing thing. The creature's limbs were long and slender, ending in what looked like fingers, or maybe twigs. It was hard to tell. They reached out towards the sky, intertwining with the branches above, and for a second, I thought I heard the faintest creaking, like the groaning of an old tree swaying in the wind. Its head was elongated, almost human, but stretched out and tapered, with no mouth that I could see. Just those eyes, man. Those bright moonlit eyes that seemed to hold centuries of wisdom and a hint of sadness. It was as if it carried the very essence of the forest within it, a guardian of sorts, or maybe something else entirely. We just stared at each other for what felt like hours. I couldn't tell you if it was curiosity or what in its gaze, but it sent shivers down my spine. After a while, it tilted its head, kind of like it was just as confused about me as I was about it. I don't know why I did it. Maybe to prove to myself I wasn't dreaming. But I reached out my hand real slow. I swear, it looked at my hand, then back at me. And it made this sound... I can't even describe it. Not threatening, but more like... Acknowledging. Then, just like that, it turned and disappeared into the trees. I blinked, and there was no sign it had ever been there. I didn't sleep much after that. Kept going over it in my mind. Next morning, I checked the spot half expecting to find those twig and rock arrangements gone, like they were part of some weird dream. But they were still there. I've never seen that creature again, and maybe it's for the best. I told a few folks about it, but I could tell they didn't believe me. Said it was probably a bear or a trick of the light. But I know what I saw. I still do my rounds, I still love the park. But I can't help but wonder about what's out there, just beyond the trails and the campfires where the moonlight turns the world into a place of silver and shadows. So there I was. The only thing I could hear was my own breath as I took deep gulps that were fogging up the icy air around me when I exhaled. I'm that type of guy who thrives in wilderness, and this time, I was tackling something big. I was tackling Denali. Not a soul in sight, just miles and miles of frozen beauty. I knew it was stupid crazy to be out there alone. And now I know even more. Let's just say I'll never do it again. It was day four, I think, July of 2014. But sometimes you can lose track when the sun barely dips below the horizon. I was following this narrow trail that weaved between snow-covered pines when I stopped dead in my tracks. About a hundred feet away, I had spotted this strange figure. It stood there on two legs, not like a bear rearing up, but like it was comfortable holding itself that way. The creature, whatever it was, had this thick white fur that made it nearly invisible against the backdrop of snow. Its stature was imposing, standing at least a couple of feet taller than me. And I'm six feet tall, on a good day. It had broad shoulders that tapered to a more slender waist which gave it a strangely humanoid silhouette. But it was the arms that got me. They were long, hanging almost to its knees, ending in what looked like massive, powerful hands, or paws. The fur seemed to ripple with muscle underneath, suggesting strength that was both mesmerizing and terrifying. Its head was something out of a storybook, a mix between a wolf and something far more ancient. There were these piercing blue eyes, so light they almost glowed against its pale face, and ears pointed and alert, twitching slightly as if picking up sounds I couldn't even begin to hear. I couldn't see a mouth, but there was a suggestion of a snout, leading me to imagine it could have a bark or a howl that matched the wildness of this place. The creature exuded a silent power, a majesty that made it seem like a spirit of the mountain itself, something old and undisturbed until now. It was eerie how it just stood there, staring in my direction like it knew something I didn't. I'm not gonna lie, my heart was racing. I blinked, maybe to make sure I wasn't just seeing things. But when I opened my eyes, it was gone. No sound, no movement, nothing. Just the empty space where it had been. 
and you know me, curiosity always gets the better of me, so I went to where it stood. The snow underfoot barely showed a sign of disturbance, which sent a shiver down my spine. How could something that size move so silently? There was a part of me that wanted to turn back, to forget I ever saw it. But then there was that other part, you know? The one that's got me into trouble more times than I can count. So, I followed the faintest trail of indents in the snow, the only proof that my eyes weren't playing tricks on me. As I tracked what little signs it left, the trees started to thin out, and I found myself at the edge of a clearing. The sun hung low, casting a golden hue over the snow, turning it into a sea of sparkling diamonds. That's when I saw it again, on the other side of the clearing, standing at the tree line. It was looking right at me, and I swear it tilted its head, like it was puzzled by the sight of me. I felt a weird connection in that moment, like it was acknowledging my presence, recognizing me as a living being too. For a long minute, we just stared at each other, and then, as if it had decided I was no threat, it turned and began to move away. Its gait was graceful, almost regal. I followed, keeping my distance, watching as it navigated the landscape with ease. It didn't take long for me to realize that this thing, whatever it was, was leading me somewhere. I could feel it in my bones. The further we went, the more the landscape changed. The snow began to give way to patches of exposed earth and the remnants of what looked like an ancient forest. Trees twisted and gnarled, their branches clawing at the sky. Then, it stopped and looked back at me one last time, before moving so quickly that I lost sight of it, and couldn't locate it again despite looking for close to an hour. Literally not a trace of it was left behind. No tracks in the earth. Nothing. It was as if it had vanished into thin air, or perhaps it had never been there at all. That's actually something I wrestle with to this day. So, I had no choice but to retreat the way we had come, when I had followed the thing like a lemming. By the time I got back to civilization, the encounter had settled deep within me. I had taken the past few hours to mull it over and try to put real words to the crazy situation. When I got back, people asked me about my trip, expecting tales of the beauty of the untouched snow. I just smiled and told them it was an adventure, one for the books and really fun. But the truth is that it was so much more than just beautiful and fun. The truth includes the fact that I can't forget those piercing eyes. And the truth is also that I haven't gone back to Denali since. Some experiences are too sacred to chase, and they build more as a memory. And for me, that creature in the mountains was one of them. It left me with a story I can barely believe myself. But it's true and I'm happy to finally be getting it off my chest with you all, who I think will understand how it's making me feel. Thank you for that. So, I've got a different kind of story for you and your listeners. When I was young, my folks moved us to Oregon from Southern California, and we bought a ranch. Actually, it was a 65-acre field of broken barbed wire and an old broken-down pump on the river, five miles from a small town in Southern Oregon, which was also in the middle of nowhere. Every day I ran in the woods chasing squirrels, birds, chipmunks, and my trusty cow dog, Spur. We lived out there for a few years. About the time I was seven or eight or so, me and my dog got grounded for being troublemakers and irritating my father. He was chained up. I was not and practically couldn't be tied to home before dark, no matter what my folks said. This was the early 80s, so there was no TV, no video games, and no internet. Truth be told, even if there had been, I wouldn't have been inside anyway. I mean, we had a TV. But during the day, no one was ever inside. We had chores and such to keep us busy. So I took off into the woods while my dad was taking a nap. I was getting out into the woods pretty far. I couldn't even hear our cows, the river, or anything except birds and squirrels. I saw a big gray tree squirrel and decided we needed to be friends. I started climbing the tree when I was about five feet up. My cowboy boots slipped and I slid down the tree, lodging my foot about three feet up the tree, where there had been a second side of the tree, growing out another direction from the larger part of the tree. I didn't panic. I had a knack for getting into complicated situations. I was so focused on trying to get my foot out from between the trees 
that I didn't realize I was being watched and was definitely in danger. My foot was pinched so tightly that I couldn't even pull my foot out of my boot. By now I was starting to freak out a little bit because I was going to be in trouble if I couldn't get home before my dad figured out I was gone. I looked up. Something had snapped a twig and my skin started to crawl when I looked up and saw the big cat eyes staring at me. It was a mountain lion. My first thought was, don't run, but then it dawned on me that I couldn't have run off if I wanted to. I was stuck tied like a goat for slaughter. It kept getting closer. I tried frantically to free my foot. It was now about 10 feet away, and I crumpled against the tree, screamed, and started crying for my mommy. Don't laugh. I was only seven or so. I heard something coming towards me faster. I put my head down and started praying. And I didn't want to look at this giant cat as it moved to eat me. About that moment, I heard the cat growl and scream out in pain, then hiss really loud, terrified. I looked in between my shoulder and the tree, scared of what I would see. At that moment, the mountain lion screamed and roared and sunk its claws in a huge, scary beast. I thought it was a grizzly standing up holding that cat by its tail. As it scratched him, he growled even louder than the mountain lion did. I swear it shook my whole body. Or maybe it was the fear of seeing all this. I'm not sure, but I was more scared than I had ever been in my little life. He was so mad at the cat that he threw it up against another tree. It screamed its scary roar and promptly ran away. Now it was me and the beast, dear God. It was even bigger than my dad my brothers, and my dog all put together, and it was walking to me. I started jumping up and down and screaming so hard that I actually peed my pants in two steps. He was standing over me, and that's when the smell of him made me choke and cough, so I couldn't scream. I clenched my fist, gonna fight till my last breath. He looked over at my hand and down at my foot. With one gigantic hand, he pushed my little fist up against myself. With the other, he pushed down on the smaller part of the tree and at the same time pushed me back, popping my foot free. He pushed me back a little bit, keeping his hand over mine like not to hit him. I clenched my fist, looking up. I realized he was bleeding really bad. I was still scared. I started to run away. I took two steps back and turned around. He was hurt because he saved me. I turned back, ran up, wrapped my arms around his huge leg looked up and said thank you. He looked at me kind of funny, like he didn't understand. I told him I was sorry and thanked him again. I actually told him I would see him tomorrow. I ran home as fast as I could, not scared anymore. I had just been saved from a cougar by the stinkiest, hairiest person I had ever met. I didn't know his name, but I knew I was safe with him out there. When I got home, my mom said I smelled like 10 dogs in a swamp. I got in the tub and didn't come out until she couldn't smell that smell anymore. My story doesn't really end there. Every day that summer, I would take my lunch and snacks out to the foot tree that still had the marks from me struggling to pull my boot out. I would leave the food there if I didn't see or smell him. Twice I could smell him and would follow my nose to the clearing where the little creek was. He would lay out there and rub the mud from the bottom of the steam into the big gash that ran down his chest and across his upper ribs. I would take him bananas, apples, jerky, and chips. He really liked potato chips, not soda. I guess it was the bubbles. He made grunting noises and loud panning noises when he liked something. He was a gentle giant. He smelled awful, like urine, really bad body odor, and wet dog mixed with dead animal. Like maybe he rubbed and rolled in a dead animal for perfume. LOL, my dog would do that from time to time. So I just figured that's what he did. But when you're a kid, I guess you just don't pay much attention. I would come home and my dog would go nuts and my mom would make me bathe. Winter came and I didn't get to go out there as much, but I still took food out there when I could. When summer came, I took his favorite chips out there and ran all over looking for him. I kept going and checking and the only things eating his snacks were squirrels, birds, and deer. Soon, we sold the ranch and moved down the road. I miss my big, hairy, stinky friend, who saved my life on that bright, sunny day. As I grew up, all I ever heard were stories about creatures like him, breaking people's cabins up, running them out of the woods, and even killing people. I thought, no way, not my friend. 
And if it was my friend or maybe any of his relatives who did any of that, it must be because someone had tried to hurt them or got them where they shouldn't be. Mankind seems to find things and then destroy them. I don't know why, but maybe there's good and bad Bigfoot, just like there's good and bad people in this world. I wouldn't be here if it had not been for the one that I met that day. I hope your listeners like my story. My son showed me your channel, and I listen to it every day and even at night while I go to sleep. There is something comforting about the stories others have seen. I just wanted people to know that they aren't all bad. I didn't tell many people about him in fear that my dad's redneck friends would hunt him and kill him. God bless you and thank you in advance for reading my story. So I was out there in Olympic National Park, and let me tell you that it's a whole different world when you're a park ranger. You think you're going to be spending your days chilling with the trees, and maybe looking at some wildlife, but you don't expect anything out of an adventure novel. At least that's what I thought until those footprints started showing up. Let me tell you, they were no ordinary footprints. I've seen my share of boots and paws on the trails, and even everything in between. But these prints were something else, huge, like nothing I could match to any critter I know. And I know them all from the tiny pika to the big old elk. At first, I just laughed it off. Kids pulling pranks, I thought. Tourists with those fake Bigfoot slippers, trying to make a YouTube video or something. But then, things started to get really weird, real fast. One evening, I was out by the Ho Rainforest, the part where the trails aren't so packed with hikers. The sun had dipped behind the trees, casting that eerie twilight glow that makes everything feel like a scene from a movie. That's when I heard it, whispers. Not the wind through the leaves whispers, but actual words. Couldn't make them out clearly, but it was like someone was having a one-sided chat behind a curtain of ferns. Now I've spent more nights than I can count out under the stars, and that's how I knew right away that something was not good here. I remembered stories from the local tribes, tales told around campfires about a guardian of the forest, an old legend they said about a spirit that watches over the wilderness. That was kid stuff, but there I was, wondering if maybe, just maybe, there was some truth to it. Weeks went by and those footprints kept appearing. I found them on the mud banks by the river, up on the ridges where the wildflowers hide even down in the valleys where the fog likes to linger. It was like something was making rounds patrolling the park. So this one night I was checking the remote cameras. We set them up to catch poachers or to get a glimpse of the wildlife we rarely see up close. I'm in the cabin, screens flickering with the night vision feed when something catches my eye. It's this figure, see? Just a shadow, really. Could have been a bear, I guess, but it moves strange upright but not like a person. It was there one second, in the corner of the frame, and then gone the next. I bolted out the door, flashlight in hand, heart thumping in my chest like it wanted out. I followed the direction I'd seen the figure, but the forest was silent. Too silent. No critter sounds. No rustling leaves. Nothing. It was like the whole place knew that something was up. I reached the spot where I'd seen the shadow on the camera. Nothing there but the regular old trees and the soft earth. But on that earth, a fresh set of those massive footprints leading off into the thicket. I had a choice then. Follow those tracks into the dark or head back to the safety of my cabin. I'm no hero from a storybook. I chose the cabin. Next morning, the footprints were gone. No sign that anything out of the ordinary had ever been there. I checked the camera footage from after I'd left. Nothing. It was as if the forest had swallowed up whatever I'd seen. I've been a ranger for a long time, and I've learned that there are things out here that don't have an explanation. You respect the wilderness. It respects you back. Sometimes that means leaving a mystery to be just that, a mystery. So whatever's out there, making those tracks whispering through the trees, I reckon it's just part of the park now. It's secret guardian or whatever. And as long as it's not harming anyone, I guess it's okay by me, but I'll tell you this much. When the night falls and the woods go quiet, I listen, just in case those whispers decide to tell their secrets. <laughs> 